tonight. It's 40 degrees below, and the snow conditions are making it impossible to pull the sledge. The British explorers have reached the pole only to see Admundsen's Norwegian flag flying there before them. They're struggling to make the long journey back, but badly dehydrated, terribly frostbitten, and low on food and fuel, they get caught in a blizzard, and Edward Adrian Wilson, Bernie Bowers, and Captain Robert Falcon Scott die in their tent just 11 miles from the one-ton supply depot that would have saved their life. Wilson is only in this for a penguin egg. I went to Antarctica too, and I didn't die. Now, there are many differences between my trip and those in the heroic age of Antarctic exploration in 1912, not the least of which is the fact that, as a woman, I wouldn't have even been allowed to be there. Hey. Science at the time would have considered my tiny little lady brain to be physiologically incapable of the rigors of scientific research. Science. Bitches! Yes. Wilson traveled on a second voyage to Antarctica on board Scott's expedition called the Terra Nova. And just getting down to the ice is one of the big differences between his expedition and mine. Wilson sailed from England around South America and South Africa to Australia and New Zealand and then down to Antarctica. That's one hell of a boat trip. I'm sorry, ship. You guys are gonna be so tired by the end of this. This whole fucking talks about ships and science. So anyway, I have a way, I know, I have a way easier time than Wilson did because I just get to fly to the tip of South America and I just take a boat from there. Now this may not be surprising for you, but ships getting stuck in the ice is sort of a running theme in Antarctic research. Wilson and Scott's first ship, the Discovery, actually got stuck in the ice for two years. So consequently, during the Terra Nova expedition, they elect to just sort of be dropped off. We skipped that whole drop-off option and just went right for it with an ice-breaking vessel. Now, on an icebreaker, with young ice, the new stuff, you can just plow right through it, like so. Vessels! <laughs> but with the old ice, the multi-year ice, you have to use your engine to drive yourself up on top of the ice and use the weight of the vessel to crack into it, and you bite forward like this, bit by bit. The sound of it below decks is deafening. Now, even though you can literally drive through ice, hitting an iceberg would still open up your ship like a can opener. And there's ice pilots on the bridge constantly on watch. And I'm shocked that they really don't like Titanic jokes. <laughs> you say the line like once and they kick you out. There is so much life out there that depends on the ice. And Edward Wilson was one of the first to document it. This guy is a physician, a scientist, an all-around badass, and one of the first what's called exploration artists. Now, an exploration artist was actually a job back then, and that's where you use your artistry to bring back these wild, unknown places to the rest of the world. He captured these beautiful images of the wildlife they encountered, even while working under adverse conditions. He would have had to create these fast sketches and take notes in the field and then run back to shelter to paint because his watercolors would freeze in the sub-zero temperatures. You have to understand how important this job is at this time where the only way to bring back the color and the life of a place is to paint it. And nowadays we get to use photography to document the landscape and the organisms that you find. This was a sea spider that we caught. They're awesome, you should look them up. <laughs> Science? <laughs> the Discovery Expedition actually marks a turning point in this documentation style, because on board is also a photographer, Herbert Ponting, and him and Wilson document the expedition side by side. So this voyage actually has one of the last great exploration artists working alongside one of the first great travel photographers. 
in the very earliest age of Antarctic exploration. The whole goal of it was just to find Antarctica and prove that it was a continent. But then, in the heroic age of Antarctic exploration, the focus becomes science. <laughs> These guys are doing extensive research in um, magnetism, uh, geology, uh, weather, and also zoology. These guys, so cute. On Scott and Wilson's prior expedition, they did extensive research on the Adelie penguin. In fact, one of the other researchers on board, Murray Levick, practically lives among the penguins. And he makes particular note of their sexually deviant behavior. <laughs> he witnesses sex for fun, homosexuality, necrophilia, you know any port in an Antarctic storm. <laughs> this so offends his Victorian sensibilities. I know, I know, this is, these are technically Edwardian sensibilities, but who's counting? <laughs> Except for like half of this whole room. <laughs> anyway, this is so salacious to him, so offensive, that he actually takes his notes in his notebook in Greek, so that if found, only a learned gentleman would be able to read them. And when he writes his paper on the biology of the Adelie penguin, the section on sexual behavior is removed. It is quietly and privately circulated to a very small number of selected scientists and then lost to the world for about 100 years until it's found in a museum filing cabinet. And now it's available online. <laughs> This paper is pretty much Fifty Shades of Black and White. <laughs> it is a real bodice ripper, let me tell you. But Edward Wilson's obsession is the Emperor Penguin. Never do this, this is very dangerous. <laughs> Before Wilson's research, the only thing that was known about the Emperor Penguin is the fact that they existed. In Wilson's first journey, he discovers the first known emperor penguin colony and figures out that they lay their eggs in the dead of the Antarctic winter. Wilson is determined to get an emperor penguin egg because he believes it holds the crucial evolutionary linkage between lizards and birds. That is because scientists at the time believed that penguins are the most primitive of all birds. This is incorrect, by the way. And that if you take a penguin egg and then you crack it open, inside you'll see like a tiny, scaly, lizardly embryo. And then you'll unlock the key to evolution. So he is determined to get this egg. He wasn't able to do it during his first voyage on the discovery. And he vows to go back and finish the job. Being able to collect this egg is likely a condition of his return on the Terra Nova. So while the rest of the world is racing to the pole, Wilson is racing to an egg. So he selects two companions to go with him out into the Antarctic winter on a journey to collect an emperor penguin egg. This journey will become known as the worst journey in the world. There's a book about it. It's called The Worst Journey <laughs> in the World. They pack up 757 pounds of gear onto two nine-foot sledges, which they haul by hand through the snow in the dark for a 130-mile round-trip journey. The temperature reaches minus 77 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun never rises in the depth of the Antarctic winter. At night, they sleep in frozen sleeping bags that are hard as a tomb, only long enough for the ice on their body to melt, soaking them through. When they wake up, they have to crouch into sledging position because their clothes will freeze them in that position for the rest of the day. They can't haul both sledges at once, and they refuse to give up a single piece of scientific equipment. So they haul one, and then they follow their footsteps back through the snow to get the second one. They are making 1.5 miles of progress for every eight hours that they work.
they finally get to the emperor penguin colony and they collect five eggs. They break two on the way back because they fall into a crevasse and then their tent blows away in a blizzard, but they make it back with their eggs. Only for Wilson to die very shortly after that, attempting to be the first to reach the South Pole with Captain Scott. You might say, I had an easier time on the ice than Wilson did. <laughs> up for debate, I don't know. Yes, it was cold work. The explorers before us would have had to burn seal blubber to keep themselves warm. But we actually had a sauna on board for emergencies, or like a Tuesday night. I'm sorry if I offended your Edwardian sensibilities. I hope that this is better. <laughs> Give me a frickin' break. I'm a scientist, not a historian. <laughs> Look, more pictures of penguins. <laughs> so we're after, <laughs> we're after penguins too, only this time, the Adelis. Dirty, dirty Adelis. <laughs> As the climate changes in Antarctica, there's a fish called the Antarctic silverfish that has historically been the basis of the Adelie penguin diet, and this fish is disappearing. We're out there hunting for this fish using these giant net toes to search the depths, and not surprisingly, we only find the fish where the water is the coldest. No ice, no fish. So this is what we think is, means that the, the Adelies are gonna have to switch their diet to some other food source, like krill but there's only one way to find out. You have to go catch a penguin. To catch a penguin, you need to leave the safety of your ice-breaking vessel and go out in a small boat. And of course, in the great tradition of those Antarctic explorers that came before us, we got stuck in the fucking ice. <laughs> and trust me, while my tiny little lady brain is perfectly capable of the strains of scientific research, the one thing that I can't do is pee standing up. <laughs> so while everybody else is getting to drink these warm beverages to keep themselves warm, I decline because I would have to drop my entire suit in order to pee. So ladies, if you go down to the ice, I highly suggest you bring one of these. <laughs> It's called a shiwi. <laughs> that way you won't get hypothermia like I did. And of course, on that day, the sauna was broken. <laughs> we were so mature about it, as you can see. They loved us. But the bird team was able to catch some of these dirty birdies. And in order to get a stomach sample, all you have to do is you gotta take your penguin and you squirt a little water in its mouth, and then, this is a real thing, and then you tip it upside down over a bucket and you, you like, give it a little shake for good measure. <laughs> and then out comes your precious, stinky scientific sample and you get this lovely bucket of penguin puke. Science! Science! Yeah. Which someone actually gets to sort through, which is super fun. And yes, the penguins were switching to a less energy-rich food source with the loss of the silverfish. Climate change in the Antarctic is a complex, multifaceted issue. But one thing is for damn sure, and that is that it is happening. Before even analyzing the data, we could see signs before our eyes. A giant ice sheet that had covered the area we were traveling in for the entire era that Antarctica, Antarctica has been known and explored had broken up, melted, leaving behind just shards of these ice flows and leaving us navigating in uncharted waters. If we aren't careful, the only thing left to explore will be what we have fucked up. Edward Wilson left us one last gift to help us navigate the trouble that we've gotten our world into. Those penguin eggs that he risked his life to get were used as a control sample later on in a study proving the existence of the pesticide DDT in the Antarctic environments, helping lead to the widespread ban, widespread ban of the chemical. So let us raise a glass to those great Antarctic explorers that have come before us, 
May we follow in your footsteps, but in warmer shoes. Ladies and gentlemen, did you, can you imagine that was Kristen's first talk on our Odds on stage? And that you could be on this very same stage? For tonight, this is it. And I want to take a moment to thank you all for journeying on this discovery of exploration with all of us. But I'd like to also take a moment to thank Christian, and Matt, Chris, new fellow Imogen, Tamar, and Arthur for their talks. Thank you to our volunteers and venue hosts who make this post happen every week. And thank you to our bartenders for getting us drunk every week. Oh, wait. Ships more. or science or whatever you want to pick for that. Thank you to our members and Patreons also for co your community of thought. And I'm going to hand it over to Imogen at this point for that. One more thank you. We're not done. I'd like to, expend, or I'd like to extend a special thank you to Casey for rocking tonight's curation. She has been a fellow since 2015, and this is her first night leading the show. Thank you so much. So in honor of all the cat slides, I have made you a special cat-eared explore. It's a kitty. And also I present you with uh, a Bale uh, curator's book, A Badass Lady Explorer. So uh, the, the memoir of Beryl Markham, enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, folks, I'm going to take a moment to just um, give some mic time to Beryl Markham, whose uh, memoir I have read, and it's fucking amazing. Also, to tonight's speaker book, if you have time in your reader agenda, All the Wonders by the folks who put on the moth is definitely worth reading. I am so grateful to all of you for showing up tonight for today's Night of Explorer. And this is not the very end of your Adsalan uh, life because next time around, we're going to get to celebrate all things absurd. So show up in two weeks for Isolde's curation of the weirdest things that you can find in the stories of the odd corners of history, art, uh, exploration, and adventure. It's the ludicrous and posturous, hard to believe tales of questionable decisions and the ridiculous at large. So if you are free on September 18th, I'm gonna send you over to the merch table where you can find reduced price tickets. If you are free and happen to be in Manhattan on September 15th, I'm gonna encourage you to show up at the Crane Theater for Renegade. And if you enjoyed tonight's show and you're hungry for more information about these fine figures, we have you covered because uh, we have a Facebook group called Something Weird where we post our follow-up on tonight's reading lists, links, and everything related to tonight's talks. It's a participatory, participatory space, so if you have ideas about the weirdest corners of art, information, science, and adventure, we encourage you to post links. And if you like to like the idea of joining us on this stage, we have a speaker's choice, a speaker's group, and we have a link, oddsalon.com slash speak, where you can join us there. We have an email list. You can join us to find links about upcoming salons. We're on all the usual places. And if you didn't spend all of your money on cocktails tonight, we'd like to can encourage you to consider hosting us as a member, post of our Patreon community, and you can get your workplace to sponsor us for a whole salon. So go online for more information or visit our fine volunteers at the merch space for more information. So that is the end of our salon tonight. Thank you for coming.
If you got some time, stick around. Even though the show is done, you don't have to go straight home. Mix, mingle, flirt. Talk to the speakers. As someone who's been in those shoes, I can vouch for the fact that it feels great to have someone find you at the end of the night to tell you did a nice job and made them laugh. Also, look for us online and come again. We love that you have come tonight, and we would love to envelop you in our Odd Salon community. Thanks for making Explore such a special night, and come again soon. <laughs>